why the ECB will be the next central bank to pivot. Now, everyone's talking about the Federal Reserve and when will they pivot, meaning when will they reverse their hawkish tightening stance that they've taken on to tackle inflation, which has absolutely crushed the stock markets, the bond markets, the cryptocurrency markets, real estate markets, the economy. Now, when they get off of that and finally turn dovish, meaning they stop raising, tightening, and let up on the markets, when will they do that? Well, everyone's waiting on this because we want to know when it's time to get back in so we can ride it all back up. Well, Jerome Powell and the Fed tell us that they're going to stick with it until the job is done. The job being bringing inflation back down. But while they may be committed to that, Mr. Market, has other plans. And we can already see other central banks realizing it's not up to them, but the market and the situations they have gotten themselves into. So in this video, I'm gonna break down which central bank blinked first. Hint, it's, it's the Bank of England, but you already know that. I'm gonna show you what other central banks are now pivoting, why the ECB looks like it will be next, and, and the Fed will be coming shortly after. I'm gonna show you what the end game ultimately is and how we should be positioning ourselves as all of this makes the final rotation. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I am trying to take these complex subjects and make them easy to understand because I get it. Like it's difficult, you don't understand what's going on and you're scared that if you don't get it right, it could be bad and you're right, it is. If you don't get this right, it could be bad, but don't worry, I got your back and we are going to make this together it's gonna be okay, as long as we play this correctly. All right, so the UK blinked first. You already know this, right? We've already been talking about this. The UK, the United Kingdom, they were the first central bank to pivot after the whole world had to start tightening, had to start raising rates, had to start tightening monetary policy, and the UK blinked first. Basically, the Bank of England, the BOE, BOE they had to act really fast to prevent a system collapse. The entire house of cards would have come crumbling down if they didn't act, but of course they did, uh, and we'll talk about this end game in a minute, so we'll come back to that. Basically what happened, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, uh, a lot of other people have already covered it, but the gilt market blew up. If you look at this action right here, I mean, this looks like a, uh, like a meme coin, like Dogecoin or something like that, like absolutely just blowing up and they were forced to intervene. And basically what happened is, and you need to understand the basic mechanics of this because this is what's happening everywhere. So basically what happened is that the Bank of England, like all central banks, like the Federal Reserve as well, kept low rates way too low for way too long. What's the wrong with that? That's great, I love it, I get cheap money. Yes, the problem is for the pension funds, for the insurance companies that need to earn yield. The pension funds take the money, they invest it, and they need to pay out yield. But when the interest rates come all the way down, how do they earn the yield? So the problem is the pension funds are, were forced to leverage. They were leveraged, how do they do that? Well, they borrow short term, so they borrow at a really cheap rate, in the short term, and then they lend it back out at a higher rate for the long term. Okay, that works really, really good until it doesn't. All of a sudden, the central bank starts raising rates, the rates go higher and higher. Next thing you know, the short term that they got at the low rate goes too high for where they had in the long term, and they start getting margin called. They had to start adding capital. Of course, they didn't have it. They started getting liquidated, and the entire pension system almost came crumbling down, but of course the Bank of England bailed them out. Emergency operation to prevent a collapse of the UK bond market. Think how bad that would have been for all the pensioners to lose it all. That's how close it was, but of course they acted, and of course they always will. We're gonna talk about the end game. Now, the ECB, the European Central Bank, so now we're talking about for the entire EU, all the nations in the EU. The European Central Bank looks like they could be the next bank to pivot. Why is that? Well, they have the same problems that the UK has. All central banks have the same problems that the UK has. So we'll talk about that. What we're seeing is that bond experts are predicting this. Now, I don't consider myself a bond expert. Uh, I like to listen to who these bond experts are. They say that the ECB, ECB indicator of stress, so that measures how dangerous, how close to blowing up these things are. The indicator of stress within the Eurozone's financial system sees massive strains in the bond market, the stock market, and the money market accounts. 
the indicator has jumped from below 0.1, so basically no risk, zero, below 0 0.1, so just barely over zero. It jumped from that to, at the start of the year to almost 0 0.5, according to Saxo Bank in the Eurozone. The index exceeded 0 0.6, so it jumped from one to five, a 500% increase in risk. So it's, don't get confused at the zero there. Look at the rate of change from one to five, 500% increase. If it continues increasing, it could reach in a matter of weeks levels of 2011, which 2011 was the big European um, crisis, all right? The peak of the European sovereign debt crisis, all right? So it could reach that level within a couple weeks if something doesn't happen like what? Like the ECB pivoting before something bad happens. You can see markets could break, as they say. The Eurozone's on the brink of financial meltdown as inflation surges, unless the ECB pivots, unless they blink next. Now, it's going to keep piling up higher and higher and higher. I believe that the Fed will follow this eventually, eventually. It'll be the last one standing. This is dollar milkshake theory. Now, we also just saw this week, Australia, the RBA now pivoted. We can see that in the headlines. What does a pivot look like? Well, here's Australia's central bank framed a dovish surprise. Remember, hawkish is harsh, restrictive. Dovish is soft and easy. So uh, here, the Australia central bank showed us what that looks like. We can see another headline right here. It says, uh, the hopes of a Fed pivot, for everyone's hoping for a Fed pivot, which will come at some point, they're rising. And here's why. Because the RBA's lower than expected rate hike has buoyed markets. So again, the central banks are going to restrict the money supply, things are going to keep going down. But as soon as they unrestrict or ease back the monetary supply, things will start booming again. Now, we can also see that on top of other banks already doing it, uh, <laughs> this was pretty interesting, I tweeted this out, the UN is demanding action, they say. By the way, if you're not following me on Twitter, you should, it's just one Mark Moss. Um, We'll link to it down below. I put a lot of commentary, daily stuff on Twitter, also on Instagram. They're both just one Mark Moss. So I talk a lot about this stuff play by play. If you want to follow that, you should. Uh, but basically, we saw the UN demand all central banks to stop rate hikes and to switch to price controls instead, because price controls always work so well. But what we can see is that the BOE, about the fifth largest central bank, pivoted. The ECB's about to pivot. The Australia's bank pivoted. The Fed's about to pivot. The UN is demanding them that they do something. Now, um, and this is why. So this is a chart of the world, and this shows us all the nations with double or more digit inflation. So almost all of South America, uh, a lot of Europe, the um, East, a lot of Africa, they're having some serious, serious problems with inflation. We're seeing these emerging markets just completely blow up. And that's why the UN is saying, hey, hey, you're blowing these nations up, their currencies, their economies, you stop it, stop raising rates. All right, now look, we know what the end game is. Well, I do, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you in a second. Uh, I think we all do. If you watch this channel on a regular basis, you know, because I go through all the way through the monetary history. We understand what money is, we understand what the monetary system is, what the history of money is. So we know what the end game is, we know it's inevitable. But the average, 35 year old money manager on Wall Street, they don't know. You could stop them and ask them, do you know about the creation of the Federal Reserve? Do you know about the creature from Jekyll Island? Do, do you know about the Bank of England? Like, they don't know about this stuff. So, this gives us an advantage, all right? It seems obvious, like everybody knows what the end game is, uh, but the answer is no, they don't. Now, if you really want to know, if you really want to dig in deep, I have this video right here. It's going to get worse. I talk about why. Um, inflation has not peaked, we'll go ahead and link to that video up here and we'll link to it down in the description below. You might want to watch this video after you're done with this one where we really dive in deep and show you why the Fed's hands are actually going to be forced. But basically, here's the cliff notes. The cliff notes is, is the end game, is that what we're going to see is instead of what we just saw, um, the pound in dollar terms and uh, the pound interest rates skyrocketing, what we're going to see instead is the dollar priced in gold terms. All right, so what we're seeing is the dollar's getting stronger because all the currencies are falling. So the pound plummeted in dollar terms. The euro's plummeting in dollar terms. What we'll see eventually is we're going to see the dollar plummet 
in gold terms, and we'll see dollar interest rates skyrocket. So they, they, they work like this, reverse. So when the currency crashes, the interest rates go up. So that's what happened in the UK. The, the pound plummeted and pushed the rates up to where they couldn't afford them anymore. And then we'll see the same thing eventually. This is the end game. The dollar will crash in gold terms and push US interest rates up, skyrocketing. What will happen then? Well, there's two choices. Two, that's it. One, well, there's really only one. The Fed will have to, they'll have to, they'll be forced to take action and they're gonna either step in or interest rates will skyrocket. So they're gonna step in and put liquidity back in or we'll see rates skyrocket 20, 30, 40% and bankrupt everybody, wipe out the whole system. So do we want to wipe out the pension funds and bankrupt the government? <laughs> the answer is no. In my opinion, in my opinion, I don't believe, history shows us this, I don't believe any nation with a money printer will go bust. They won't do it. Why would the US bankrupt themselves when they could just print more money? The answer is, of course, they won't. Now, we're already seeing this sniffed out. Now, I said it's gonna happen in the gold market because gold's money, gold's been money for 5,000 years. Central banks are buying massive amounts of gold. They're buying more gold than they have in any time in history since we got off the gold standard. And so the gold markets are sniffing this out first. So just in the last few days, since we saw the situation with the UK, the BOE, what's happening in Australia, look at the price of gold. Now this is a 7% move. I get it, 7%, it's tiny. But when you're looking at the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, 7% moves are pretty big. In gold markets, 7% is a really big move. Now for leverage, we'd look at gold miners. Here's the GDX. It's a basket of gold miners. And we can see a 7% move in gold, a 21, almost a 22% move in the gold miners. Why is that? Because gold miners have leverage. Instead of just a couple bucks on one ounce, they have hundreds of millions of ounces times a couple bucks, you kind of get the idea. So that's my preferred way to play this. Now, it seems so simple how to play this, right? The end game, in my opinion, seems like the only way out. Now, the government could choose to bankrupt themselves. I just don't see why that would happen. All right, now it seems so simple. So now I'm gonna switch to, uh, I'm gonna talk about a gold mining company. Now, disclaimer, this is a promotional video. I do these. Uh, about once a month, every six weeks. I like to use an actual company that I do an evaluation on so I can show you what I'm looking at. I'm not telling you to buy this company. It's a promotional video. However, it's a great teaching tool. It's educational, and I think it's a great company to take a look at. All right, um, for a disclaimer, I do not own this company. <laughs> I'm not buying it, but I think it's a good illustration. So what we wanna do to make money, so simple, right? We buy low and sell high. Sounds simple, right? So what we'd wanna do is when uh, we buy when others are fearful, so at the bottom of a bear market we buy, we sell when others are greedy at the top of a market. And that's exactly what this company Gold Mining did, the founder, Ad Admir Adani. He went around and acquired the very best gold assets in the bear market. So 2012, 2013, 2014, when gold was in a bear market, he went and bought all these up. He bought 14 of the best projects in the world at the bottom of the market at bare bones pricing. Those 14 projects have approximately 32 million ounces in the ground. Remember, if gold goes up by 500 bucks, that's cool, you make 500 bucks. But if you have 32 million ounces times 500 bucks, that's a big number. Now, if we take um, the total amount of assets uh, or ounces in the ground divided by the market cap, we're at about $2.50 uh, an ounce when gold's more at about 16, 1700 per ounce. Now, I use this statement all the time. Uh, Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger says it. The big money is not in the buying and the selling. It's in the waiting. You're looking for a trend to develop. You get in, you wait, and that's how you make the big money. Not day trading, not weekly trading. You don't make big money that way. Sure, I mean, you make a couple bucks here and there. The big money's made in the waiting, and so that's exactly what they've done. They bought these in the bottom of the bear market, 2014, 2015, and then they had to wait. They had to wait for the trend to turn, which is happening right now. So let's take a look at that. All right, so after sitting on these and waiting, and now the tide is turning. We can see the price of gold is pumping. We see physical golds are being uh, liquidated or, or there's shortage of physicals everywhere. And now it's time to take action. So uh, gold mining has brought on a new CEO, Alistar Still. He is the CEO from Newmont Mining. You might recognize that name. It is the largest gold mining company in the world. 
they merged with Barrick Gold, which you might remember Warren Buffett, who hates gold, actually bought a gold mining company. It was Barrick. Yeah, that one. So Newmont Mining is the largest gold mining company in the world. They took Alistar Still, the CEO, and he is now the CEO of Gold Mining Inc. Now, typically, when you're from a big company, you don't want to go work for a uh, bad company. And so that kind of tells you something about it. Um, and what they want to do now is they want to monetize the projects and start to unbundle the value. So they bought 14 companies at the bear market. Now it's time to unbundle them, break them apart, turn them into their own projects. That's exactly what they're doing. Now we can see the management of the company. I always like to see who the leadership is. And again, we have Alistar Still, Chief Executive Officer, CEO, again, from Newmont Mining. Of course, we have Amir Adani, who's a prolific uh, entrepreneur, investor, resource investor as well. So we have good management. But what they're doing here, two things that I'm pretty excited about. One, they spun out a company called Geroy. This is a gold royalty company. Royalty companies are great. They're guaranteed profit regardless of what the costs go up, which is good in a time with inflation. So they're guaranteed a profit on that. And as a matter of fact, the, the spin out subsidiary of the gold royalty company is paying a million dollars in dividend cash flow back to Gold Mining Inc. Pretty rare to find a company that has a million dollars of dividend cash flow coming back in. They're also spinning out another company right now called Whistler. This is in Alaska. Now, I put this here, maybe it might have about a $300 million valuation. Why is that? Well, right now, this project, Whistler, right next door is another project that has about a $150 million valuation. But Whistler has double the resources and it has double the size. So it could easily, theoretically, be worth double, if not more, potentially 300 million. Now, both of these companies are planning IPOs that become, should be coming soon. Now, gold mining only has about a $125 million market cap. If it can spin out a company that's worth 300 million, imagine what that does to the company. We're gonna break down the numbers here in a second, but what you can see, these are plans to unlock uh, value. So here, the creation of the gold royalty, um, it's a hundred million dollar in value right there. They modernized, updated their mineral resource um, estimates. So now we see no, how much uh, gold they have. Uh, they strengthened their technical teams. They've added more team. They've started drilling now. So they're actually getting that out. Uh, they created the gold mining. Um, they moved it up to an NYSE stock. So they've doing, done a lot of work there. Now, Let's break down some of the numbers, okay? So the, right now, the gold mining market cap is 125 million-ish, approximately, all right? They own the gold royalty company. They own 20 million shares at $3 per share. So that's about a $60 million valuation. That's an asset they own, 60 million. So if we take <clears throat> the 60 million, take it out of the 125, get an adjusted market cap of 65 million. They have 32 million ounces in the ground. We divide the 32 million ounces by the 65 million adjusted market cap. That values their gold at about $2 per ounce. Now, typically a gold mining company would value its gold in the ground at about $40 per ounce. So instead of paying 40, which is kind of the market average, we're able to get it for $2 per ounce. This is 95% below the, the average, the median, which means we could easily have a 10X just getting back to market. Now, why is it so cheap then? Because the entire gold market cap has is, is gotten smashed down. It's just turning right now. In addition, they bought all these assets at the bottom of the bear market and they're just now starting to unbundle them and break them apart. Now, you add in uh, G. Roy, sorry, that's a, a typo. You add in the royalty company, plus you add in the Whistler, plus you add in 13 other projects that they still have. And you can start to see that this is a very undervalued assets, which again, we want to buy low and sell high as the price of gold back, goes back up. So to summarize, central banks, they're either going to go bankrupt or they're gonna pivot and pump money back in. Of course, I believe they're gonna pump money back in. I believe that asset prices, specifically commodities, will roar. I've been talking about this since last year. We've been having this sector rotation out of growth assets and into real world assets. It's what Vladimir uh, Putin is talking about, where the economy of imaginary wealth, fake fiat currency, will disappear and it will be the economy of real assets, gold, wheat, oil, natural gas, etc. Now we can see that gold's already sniffing this out. It's already moving. Right? It's already seen it. Now, most people haven't picked up on it yet, but gold is sniffing it out. 
I like gold in the ground because it gives us leverage. Instead of if gold goes up by a couple hundred bucks an ounce, cool, but if we have 32 million ounces, that's even better. And I like this project. We have some of the best gold investors in the world, Marin Katusa, Doug Casey, Sprott, Rick Rule. They're all in on this project. Again, I'm not telling you to buy it, but it's a good one to take a look at. If you're looking at old other gold mining opportunities, you have a framework to measure them against. And I think what's gonna happen with gold is inevitable because what's gonna happen with the central bank is inevitable. But what do you think? Do you think they will go bankrupt and not print? Or will they print and not go bankrupt? Leave me a comment, let me know what you think. As always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down, that's okay. But at least tell me why in the description. Hit that subscribe button while you're at it. And that's what I got. To your success, I'm out.